lifting up our nation. You are the one who sets leaders into positions. You are the one who causes the rise and fall of nations. You are the one who orchestrates leadership. Romans 13 tells us that you are the one who has set into place governing authorities, that we should respect them. And we pray for them and we bless them. And, but Father, what are we to do when there's so much in conflict with your holy word? Oh, Father, we pray and we bless our nation. We pray today over President Joe Biden. I pray over his heart, over his mind, over his soul. I pray for strength. And I ask that you would speak to his heart. Speak to him today, Father. Guide him in the way he should go. And I pray over former President Donald Trump. I speak the blood of Jesus over him. Praying. For your will to be done on November 5th. We ask God that you would lead and guide this nation. We stand on the shoulders of people who sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. Many calloused knees in prayer for our nation. And Lord, we stand with them. We stand on the side of righteousness. And we pray for truth. We're not afraid of truth. And we pray... Lord, that there would be a real sense of wisdom permeating our nation as we lead into this summer and going into the fall. In the name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Well, I want to share with you uh, just from my heart for a few moments about communion. We're going to receive communion here in the service. More and more, I'm realizing how incredibly important communion is. Mm -hmm. How precious it is. How important and amazing it is. So I want to share with you a message called The Bread of the Presence. And I want you to know that the instructions I had were from the Holy Spirit were very explicit that today this message should come from my heart, that it would be an improvisation. I do not have any notes. I've got a couple of scriptures that I know for sure I want to share. But I just want to I want to talk to you from my heart about how incredibly important it is when we receive communion, when we come to the Lord's table, and that we not take it lightly, and, and also that we don't take it for granted, but we realize it cost Jesus everything so that we could have this meal, the bread of the presence. Well, that, that word, that phrase, comes from the book of Exodus. And I would like you to look there with me, Exodus 25. Verse 30, this is an instruction that's given to the priests at the time of the tabernacle. They had a table where daily they put fresh bread on the table. And at verse number 30, the instruction to them was place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. You can just imagine what a, a sacred and holy place it was where the bread of the presence was honored and revered and, and it was fresh every day. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't once a week like church service. It, it wasn't once in a while like revival meetings. But it was daily the bread of the presence, fresh bread every day. And my encouragement to all of us is living daily in the presence of Almighty God. Partaking of the bread of His presence daily. Whether we're eating a wafer and drinking a cup or not. But our mindset is that every day we're waiting, we're seeking, we're praying, we're enjoying the bread of the presence. And of course, the bread of the presence is really, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. 
Because look with me at John chapter 6, and there's this amazing encounter. And I'm going to read actually verses 32 all the way down to verse 40. And I, I encourage you, follow along with me. So Jesus, He's being contested. It's very heated. He's, he's talking with um, Pharisees, and He's engaged them in the previous chapter. And now, in chapter 6, you've got this large crowd. And the crowd has been firing back at Him some questions and interacting with Him. And he even had an indictment against the crowd, said, you're only following Me because I fed you, that's all. And look at this, verse 32, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my Father did. And now He offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me. Not to do my own will. And this is the will of God. That I should not lose even one of those He has given me. But that, that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. So you have the model from the Old Testament, the bread of the presence in the holy place. And then in the New Testament, Jesus comes along and says, guess what? I am that bread. Jesus says, you think that, that Moses gave you manna in the wilderness and for 40 years you ate bread every morning and you collected it and on the sixth day the most miracle, most miraculous thing happened. You, you took the manna and, and stored it up and it lasted for two days so that every Sabbath you didn't have to go collect food. It was already there for you. But if you tried to store it up any other day of the week, it would get rotten. It would get maggots in it. And, and, and this happened for 40 years. Manna from heaven. You think Moses gave you the manna? No. My Father gave you the manna. My Father sustains you. My Father strengthens you. I am the bread of life. Now get this about Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It is interpreted house of bread. Funny thing about it, Bethlehem, Bayit Lechem. Bayit is house, Lechem is bread, Bayit Lechem, house of bread. What a beautiful picture. But the funny thing about it is, Bethlehem is under Palestinian control right now. Let that wash over you. But the house of bread produced Jesus who says, I am the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And I want to share something else with you. If you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Actually what's going on here is that Paul is, is writing to the church in Corinth and he's having to bring some correction to one particular issue. They had an instance of sexual immorality. They had winked at it. They just said, oh, it's not that big of a deal. They did handle it in time and they handled it correctly. And later on he comes back and commends them for it. But at this moment, it's pretty hot. It's heated. This is a hot button. And in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 6, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, bringing correction, and as part of just a sort of a by-comment, 
like, like a, uh, just a side note. Notice what he says. Verse 6, your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. And then here it is. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Can you just imagine how sobering it must have been the night of Jesus' arrest when they gather in the upper room And he says to them, this bread is my body. Breaks the bread. He tears the bread. He rips the bread. This is my body. And it's broken for you. And then he says, this cup, this cup is my blood poured out for you. Must have been a very sobering moment as they realized what Paul articulated after this a few decades. Oh my goodness, Jesus Himself is our Passover lamb. As we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are showing our belief in His death. We are honoring His resurrection. We are saying His, his lifeblood gives me life. His, his goals, His hopes, His dreams, His ministry, His kingdom. That's what I want to side with. That's what I want to join with. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Now I'm going to throw some $9 words at you for a minute. These are biggies. Um, there's, there's been primarily three main interpretations of communion down through the years. Sometimes it's called Holy Communion. Sometimes it's called the Lord's Table. Sometimes you'll hear memorial communion. Churches do it in all kinds of different ways. Um, here at our church, we do it once a month, typically on the first Sunday of the month. There's nothing that says it should be once a month. You don't find that in the Bible anywhere. Uh, there's many churches that they receive communion every time they worship. That's special and meaningful. But I also fear it. I wonder if, if it becomes routine. But then also, there's some churches, they never do communion. I mean, it's like maybe once a year, have we had communion lately? Or we should probably, oh, yeah, that's probably a good idea. We should do communion. Uh, let's tack it on at the end of the service. And like when we're, when we're done really having church, when we're all done with church, uh, we'll do that at the end. And there, there's so many different approaches. In fact, uh, in more of the definitely the Catholic way, and then I would say Episcopalian and Lutheran as well, communion is the worship service. The entire liturgy is built around communion. Not so much in, in our branch of God's church. We just haven't done it that way in our tribe. But you've noticed this Always, since I've been your pastor, I've placed a really high emphasis on communion. It's very, very important. And so, uh, the Catholics were the first to try to decide and try to describe what communion is. And they came up with this big word called transubstantiation. <laughs> 
And transubstantiation means this. The bread and the juice, it is transformed at the moment that you eat it. They literally believe that when you eat the bread, it becomes the physical body of Christ. It's a little bit morbid. They wouldn't talk a whole lot about that. Um, but the, the cup, it, it was just wine, but now all of a sudden, I'm literally drinking the blood of Jesus. And that's why you're not allowed to toss the extras away because this is the blood and the body of Christ. Transubstantiation. I love, I love their emphasis on the presence. That God is present in communion. I think they missed it on quite how to articulate that. Along came guys like um, Calvin, Luther, and, and Zwingli, and others, and they said, not transubstantiation, but consubstantiation. Consubstantiation means this, that we, we deny that this is physically the blood and the physical body of Jesus. We're not cannibals. Come on. But we do believe that in some mysterious way, Christ is with us as we receive communion. The Latin phrase, con, with, with substance, consubstantiation. And so, boy, I have a lot of affinity for that. I, I side probably out of the three. I lean more that direction than any of them. And then the third one is simply memorial. Uh, it is it's just a memorial. You might think of the word ritual, routine, um, celebration. It's just something we memorialize. And, and I love I love ceremony. I, I love memorials. I, I didn't get to be with you at Memorial Day last Sunday, but I love Memorial Day. I hope you enjoyed it. It, it, was, uh, it was really wonderful, the thought of reciting the pledge to the Christian flag and the pledge to the American flag. I love that. I'm a patriotic guy. Cut me and I bleed red, white, and blue. Um, I, for Memorial Day, I don't know what you did, what Stephanie and I did. Um, we watched the transition from the Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass, who was number 19 for the Air Force. She was the, the 19th CSM. Transferred to number 20, uh, David Flossy is now the, the uh, Chief Master Sergeant of, of the Air Force. And it was a big ceremony and <clears throat> lots of uh, lots of uh, pomp and circumstance. Man, I love ceremony. Can I tell you? There's a part of me that misses the old days at Bethel Assembly of God Church when it was Communion Sunday and the brothers would dress in the best suit and you had six of them and they would come and take the top off the communion tray and then hand it to him and then they would all wait and then the six of them would go and serve everyone in, in the sanctuary and it was a lot of ceremony and I, I loved it. I, I love ceremony but I do think that ceremony doesn't quite capture it. It's more than routine. It's more than ritual. It's more than memorial. I guess I still struggle transubstantiation, consubstantiation, memorialism, where do I fall? I'm not quite sure. I like little things about all of them, but I do believe that somehow, mysteriously, God's presence is with us when we receive communion. But most of all, the thing is that we need to search our hearts and be serious when we receive communion. It's more than just a ceremony. 
This is us saying, Lord, I'm still following You. This is us voicing, You are my healer. You are my provider. My trust is in You, Lord. And every time we eat that bread and we drink that cup, it's a beautiful time of being in God's presence. The emphasis is on presence. The bread of the presence. I want to close with this scripture. It's Luke 22. And I simply want to read Luke's account of communion. And it begins at... I'm, go, I'm going to begin at... Um, Well, let's just let's start at verse 7. Let's just start right here. And we're going to read all the way down. I, I guess I'm planning to read all the way through verse 20. Let's just read that whole chunk. Now, verse 7. Now the festival of, festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent John and Peter ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asked, Where is the guest room where, uh, where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that's already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. Pause for just a moment. It, isn't this amazing? I mean, this is, this is more than, oh yeah, let me give you the GPS. You just plug it in. You punch in this address, guys, and it'll take you right there. No, this is sort of like, um, I mean, I could understand if he said, you're going to go to a sign, you'll see a big sign holding a donut, right? <laughs> Turn left at the big donut. And then go down a ways and then you're going to cross this street and the second house on the right, go upstairs. It's not that. It's more, it's more like, yeah, while you're driving down Watson Road, you're going to see a blue pickup truck. Get in the lane behind him and follow him. I mean, this is amazing. You're going to walk along, you're going to encounter this man and you just follow him and when he gets there you say, where are we supposed to eat? Oh yeah, you're the ones. Uh, just go on up. It's already up in the second floor. It's incredible. This is amazing. Verse 13, they went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus said. And they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table and Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks, for, thanks to God for it. And then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Verse 19, he took some bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and His people. An agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. I don't know about you, but I am so, so grateful, so thankful for everything that Jesus did for us. Right now, the children are going to be coming back in and joining the parents. And I want to invite our, our worship team for you guys to go ahead and come back up. And um, 
we're going to provide just really soft, worshipful background. And here's what I would like to ask of, of you today. You can see that we have four different stations. We, at our church, we don't require you to be a, a member of the church to take communion. But it's, it's incredibly important that you love Jesus. It's not something you do lightly. If you love Jesus, if you follow Him, we welcome you. We invite you to this meal with us. Also, we leave it up to mom and dad to decide for the little kids. Um, sometimes parents will ask me, well, what age is a child old enough to have communion? And I just simply say, well, you know, I just trust you. If your child really loves Jesus and has asked Jesus into their heart and serves Jesus, and I, I welcome you to, to come, even as a, a family, to receive communion together. But today's going to be different. You noticed it's, it's, not, it's not a ceremony. It's not tacked on at the end. And even though sometimes we receive communion as part of our worshiping, singing, <coughs> Not very often do we do it this way. What I'm asking you is to take your cup and find a place to be alone with the Lord for some moments. You might want to take your cup back to your seat. You're welcome to sit at your chair. You're also welcome to kneel at your chair if you would like to be in prayer. But here's the thing also. You are also welcome to do this because... There's something, can I just say, there's something really special about all of us gathering together in the front as the family of God. And so I, I welcome you to, to find one of these chairs up at the front or to even to kneel or to sit at the altar benches on the side. Or if this is a little bit of a high stage, but if you're able to kneel at that stage, or lean against it, you're welcome to do that. If you want to sit on the steps, I, I just invite you, I'm just sensing, I would love for us to be together. Like, like at the family gathering where we get the kid table out and we squeeze in. You know what I'm saying? I just, the whole family just coming together and being together as we receive communion. And so, I invite you to find a place begin to pray about what you've received the teaching today and and by the way do you receive the teaching today have you heard the word of God and do you promise to to really apply it to your life in whatever way the Holy Spirit deems for us but would you take your cup find a place and just seek and wait don't re don't receive communion just yet I'm going to invite all of us to do that together after a few moments, but we're going to ease into some background worshipful songs, and we really, really hope that you will, that you will just be alone with the Lord, but together with your church family. So having said that, I invite you to come right now. Would you just come, find one of these places, and just get alone with the Lord.